understand macros, you have to look, use them for a long time. But I will try to um, give you the motivation to to find out yourself, okay? Because um, what I think macros are the killer feature in hex, and I will try to uh, tell this to you. So let's look a bit about um, what this talk is about. First, we're going to say uh, why do we want macros at all? Because uh, it's a valid question. And then we're going to look a bit into how they do what they do. Not too much, but just to give you an idea of what's happening at all. And then I'm just going to show you some examples of macro code that is already out there. I mean, it's not going to be exhaustive, but uh, you know, a few things. And then I will try to uh, propose a conclusion. This talk for all of you, but um, we'll see. So um, yeah, this is this is something that uh, actually happened a couple of months back on the mailing list. Someone was asking, why do we want that? Um, what what do they really solve? Um, how do they compose with the rest of the language? How do they work with OOP? Or are they more for functional programming? You know all these kinds of things. And uh, how do the? I mean, this is a real quote. This was the the question. So I would say, and about every way you can imagine, macros make your life a lot happier. I mean, it's true for me. I'm very happy doing macro programming. <laughs> So um, that's to answer the last question. Uh, the second question, I would say, um, well, they are completely orthogonal to OOP. So you can, if you don't like OOP and hex, you don't have to do it. And if you don't like it, you also can use macros that have nothing to do with OOP. I will show a small example going into the direction later. And the um, last question is, what problems do macros really solve? And, uh, well, it's more than actually just solving our personal curiosity and having fun. And uh, I, will try to, um, I will try to impress you now. So please present. <laughs> um, well, not quite yet. OK, so this is a small um, thing I built in the last couple of days to, to read a couple of uh, breaks and um, okay, what you see here is basically uh, the early beginning of a GUI framework that will resize nicely and uh, as a result of flow, we can have it in both directions and it um, has full bindings. So as you type here, it just uh, you know kind of does this thing. And um, I mean, there's a lot of non-macro code in there. But uh, I basically had the ideas for that for the last five years, how to implement these things. Um, but macro, this is like altogether some 400 lines of code, what you see here. So the whole framework and stuff like that. Um, of course, based on a layer of another library of mine, but um, you can really, because, because macros allow you to do powerful things, um, you, can, you can really <coughs> Um, just kind of write down what you what you think you want to do, and so it makes these kinds of things rather uh, complicated. I thought they were I thought they were complicated, but they don't necessarily have to be. And then there's another small thing I would like to show. Okay, that's that. Um, okay, so this has been a great idea. Um, here I took an attempt, an attempt, maybe some people of you know Jade or Hamel. These are the hex templating languages. Uh, no, these are templating languages in general to create uh, HTML. And I kind of took the Hamel example of Wikipedia and I created um, in hex a domain specific language that basically looks the same way but is embedded into the language. So for example, you see here these are some log entries and they have a date. And down here, I reuse, I iterate those entries. I took, I see when it is posted, and I want to format it. Which, because it is embedded, comes actually right here from using date tools. So you can really kind of use the whole language. And for example, okay, if I want to write this and I try to compile, then it's going to say me that my resolution is too small. <laughs> 
But it's going to say me there's no field, field body G, and I have that kind of directly in my template language, so I can just compile. And um, because it's really just more a, a domain-specific language, it can spit out a couple of things. This, for example, generates XML. So um, maybe we can we can look at the beautiful JavaScript source. Okay, everything's on. Okay, well this <laughs> generates normal uh, JavaScript uh, code, and that's another generator right now. Which, do you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is called fast, and what this actually does is um, it will assemble all the data in a string buffer. And it's uh, currently, I did some benchmarking, and it's uh, even faster than Tempo right now. Um, and it does a lot of optimization. So for example, if we realize that this whole stuff here is static, so in the string buffer, it will combine it into one operation. It doesn't actually build much structure. So if one could look at the JavaScript code, <laughs> one would see that actually it's a lot of, a lot of strings, and you get all those kind of things uh, for free. So if you just run and compile this. And then they can. Here. Okay, so this is the code that has been generated, and this is uh, how it's rendered, so to speak. And so these are the, the kinds of things um, we can do with macro, just to yeah, give you an idea where this might be um, going. And uh, so uh, other things that you might know and might be using right now is also a standard format for string interpolation. I guess many people have seen that. Um, Sport, which also uses macros now to bring in more type safety and uh, some advanced operations, and hex shader language, which some of you might know, which um, is also an embedded specific language to write shaders directly in hex if you don't want to write assembly the way Adobe um, would like you to. Or it's probably the best thing to come up with, but uh, <laughs> we got hex, so uh, and we got the good. <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, did this for us, and it's very pleasant. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the question is, why do we actually want macros? And the answer is, uh, we want expressiveness in the end. We want to write a very little code. Uh, we want to have a high signal to noise ratio. We don't want to. We don't want to write Java basically. We want to really just for a single thought. We want to have one single line of code and not. And, and not boilerplate and anything like that. And there's um, two ways to go about this. One is adding language features, kind of, and then they get into their way and people are getting confused. Uh, there's this great uh, quote about uh, C++ operator overloading. I saw C out, shifted left, hello world times, and I decided to stop right there. <laughs> and <laughs> so this is a dangerous road. I mean, you have, you have to have uh, language features because otherwise you don't get anything done. Um, but you have to know where to stop or how to restrict them. And uh, the other way to go there is um, to have a lot of extensibility. So, for example, if you imagine this as a spectrum, some people might have. Has anyone ever toyed with Lisp? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, not very many features, <laughs> but a hell of a lot of extensibility. And um, this is basically the better road to go down. So what you do, you can kind of bend your language with the language itself, well, ideally. And uh, you can you can make it do what you want. You can adapt it to your to your, um, to your needs. There's an approach called language oriented programming, where in fact for every problem domain, you just create your domain specific language, and then you just uh, write your code. And this is, macros are taking us there, because we can really just uh, make things small, concise, easy. So this is why we need them. OK, so now I'm going to give you a brief overview of how this actually works. Um, so this is how the, this is a very simplified view of the Hex compiler. <laughs> um, of many compilers, in fact. <laughs> the Hex compiler happens to work uh, the same way. Um, so 
you first consume some source code, of course, and um, then it creates an intermediary kind of model of the things that you have. So uh, the analyzed syntax tree and the model of the types that exist and things like that. And then it just goes and, and outputs that to, to whatever your target is. And now, um, since about a year and a half, we put this bit. Um, and so what macros actually do is, um, okay, I didn't really show that. Macros also come come from there, from the source code. But what they do is they operate on those on those past information, so on all those on this uh, abstract data that you have about about your code, um, which is different from something like C macros that you might know or other preprocessors who really just um, substitute strings without knowing what they are doing. And so um, the cool thing about this is that. You change some things, and then the compiler will recheck: Does it actually make sense what you are doing? Or uh, and you cannot generate bad syntax and things like that. So it, it's a lot safer than, for example, the C alternative. So um, there's a lot of text. So macros are basically, as I said, uh, they are actual hex functions, actual functions that get executed the way we know functions. And um, what they do: They take an expression or multiple expressions. And they transform it into something else. Something else is again an expression. Um, uh, that's the most simple macro usage, if you will. And um, they can build enums and classes, so kind of automate a lot of boiler code generation and things like that. Uh, they can even declare whole new types, um, which are not present in your code base at all. Kind of like you could generate random classes if you wanted to. And there's not much point in that, but uh, you could. And of course, uh, which is very interesting for things like code coverage tools or dependency graphs or any kind of things, um, they can pro post process all the declarations that you have in your hex program. They can dispatch it. So you could basically um, generate your documentations from within your macros as well if you, if you wanted that. And they always get called in some kind of inspectable context. So you can find out about the things that are going on in your whole uh, program in your whole code base, and uh, respond accordingly. So you can do very intelligent, very complex things. So this is some very simple code. In fact, it is so simple that you don't see much of a difference. So we have uh, two functions, um, one of which is a macro, which is a regular macro function, as I said. But it is prefixed with this, uh, this bit, which is the magic bit. And uh, they actually, essentially, you might say they do the same thing because they take something and they return it. Both represent identity. But the top one is actually happening at runtime. So what happens is really at runtime, this code gets executed and it chooses just to do nothing and return something. Um, well, to return the same value. Well, this is a macro. So it will actually consume this expression five and will just return it. So at the end, it is as if you had written five at the place where it's being called. Okay, so that's not particularly impressive, but that is really just to see the, 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 the simple difference between them. So, um, and also what you see here, here this is an integer, the type, and here it is something that's an expression. This is how an hex represents expression. And we'll have a look at that. And this is basically how it happens. So an expression consists of two things. The expression definition, which contains the actual data. You can see that. And a position, um, which is kind of the position where the compiler finds this in your code. So if there's an error, uh, it can say, OK, this error occurred here. And then you get accurate error displays, which I showed you, for example, in the uh, example of the template language. I used a field that wasn't there. And the, uh, the IDE was able to say, OK, this error occurred here, and not just somewhere within, within anything. Okay. Um, so OK, and these are some of the expression definitions. And it might look a bit uh, weird or strange to work with. But it's really uh, actually simple, so I'm just going to show it. The first one up here is the so-called constant, which 
I think it's a bit misleading. You could think of it as an atom, and above are some valid atoms, or, uh, actually constants are valid atoms, but uh, identifiers are as well. So this is basically the, the basic building blocks in your in your app. And then you see that actually, as you go on, this corresponds rather nicely. So you have a call, and the green bit is the call target, and then you have a parameter list, which is accordingly an array, and so on, and so forth. Here you see this is an array axis, so you have uh, the target and the index, and so on. Okay, but I guess you kind of get the gist. So um, we will do something a bit more complicated right now. Um, we want to print Hello World twice, which is also not very, uh, very uh, advanced. But here we see a few of those things in action. So we actually construct a new expression that is a block that dupli duplicates the body that we've been given. So it executes it twice. And uh, it generates this expression at the position of the original expression. So if there were an error, it would map back to that position. Um, so if you were to run this code, it would print you twice hello world um, without actually, um, well, okay, this is not my German advantage, but uh, if you think about it, it doesn't, for example, have the overhead of looping through those things or the redundancy of having put this thing twice, it has neither of both. So now we're going to <laughs> become a little bit more complicated. <laughs> This is just, uh, if you don't understand tiny bits, it's not so bad, okay? Um, because this uh, takes some time. But it's just to give you a general idea of, uh, of what can happen if you, if you uh, do it. So there's this uh, context class, which I, I spoke about the inspectable context that you have, and uh, it is represented through that. So for example, we want uh, a function that will trace hello, echo, Ten times, or well, an arbitrary amount of times. So first, um, we will look: is this thing, is this, uh, is this count expression here, is it an integer? Which we do by kind of looking at the type of the count, and then it's maybe something good or not. And if it's not, then we can raise an an error at that position. If we were to put a string here, then it would display: okay, this is not an integer. And then we start, uh, we take the current position, this is just a shortcut, and then we, we take, for example, the, the expression that will become zero, we generate an identifier i, and we um, kind of slowly begin to build up the code around it, because actually such a for loop for you is just this big, but it's a complex data structure, in fact, I mean, it's a, you have many, uh, many sub-expressions in that. You have uh, the thing that you're looping over, you have the body, you have the thing that is iterating, and this is just being generated here, basically. So the loop variable, the loop target, the loop head, and then we finally make the for loop, which has that head and that body, and return it. And so if you run that code, um, it will just print hello echo 10 times, and you can do like 300 times or anything you want. Um, but again, it's not um, in this case, you don't have to write the loop by yourself. <laughs> but, uh, I think I even used something like that once because I was very lazy. Um, <laughs> although it's not much shorter, but it's just to explain how the context actually is working. So um, what we were doing right here is we were doing a bit of the compiler's work. <laughs> because uh, we can actually say, for example, we want an expression that is an integer greatly simplifies all the above. The rest is the same. It's just lawless code. And uh, if that's still too much for you, I have created a library for working with macros, which uh, will give you two ways to write the same code in one line. One is uh, through a macro tools, which uses a lot of using. And it says just like make the interval between the expression zero and the count and iterate over it with a body. And this just really happens through using a lot. And uh, there's this other thing which is probably better known from Lisp, which is um, kind of quasi quotation. The idea is here, what you see is actually you write the expression that you want to have, and then you just say, okay, this part 
and this part I want to inject from the other context. So I don't have to build all this myself. I can just go, okay, I mean, I know what I want. I want to write it down and just fit in my small bits right here. Um, so that's on, on GitHub. It's documented. It is. Um, and uh, it's even more less current, the documentation. Um, so yes, you can, I mean, if you want to do macros, you can, of course, you're free to do it any way you want it. Um, I read a lot of them, and this library is quite battle tested. I started it a year and a half ago, about the time when macros came out. And um, there's a couple of projects using, using it, so I would really claim it's reliable. Um, so with that, this higher level of extraction, we can kind of, oh no, we don't really need to do that. Okay, this is, this is for example, a simple example where you, you can just take a string, uh, you can uh, take a string and interpret that as a file position relative to your current file, and you can take its contents and put it directly into your hex code. So that's very nice. If you don't want to pass by resources or load some strings at runtime, you just have some file that has some configuration and what it write in your code as if it were there without actually doing that. Um, this macro will do it for you, so if you say embed string from file, I don't know, something .txt, then the whole content is going to go there and it's it F as if it were a string constant at that position to the content from the file. It's actually quite easy to do. To, to. And this, for example, is um, bulk updating. I know some people of you, uh, there was even a discussion of that on the mailing list about a while back, whether we could do this or not. If you want to set multiple properties on an object at the same time, um, one nice way to do this, uh, which is also doable in AS3 and JavaScript, is to take an anonymous object and then you loop through it, and then you copy the properties that you find and you put them there. So this, for example, yeah, many people do this. Um, but this goes through this reflection, so it has a couple of obvious flaws. It doesn't type safe, it's slow, and, you know, name. And so you can implement the same thing as a macro. It looks the same way. And what this macro actually will do, it will check whether we have an, an inline object declaration here as a parameter. And if so, it will just, you know, build a block of statements that actually extract the expressions that are there and assign them. So actually the end result is a, is a block that will assign minus c.x to 100, y to 200, alpha to 0.5. And uh, if you ever type in a property that doesn't exist, it will give you a compile time error. So um, the next thing, and that's something I like to do a lot, is um, Hex allows you to build classes and enums. So um, you basically have a macro that picks up a class declaration or an enum declaration, and you can start um, adding additional fields, changing fields, things like that. And this all happens with, uh, with data structures that look basically like this. So we have a field, the field has a name, documentation, has an access, which is an array of things like inline, public, static, things like that. It has a type, which is also things you know, you can either have a variable or a property or a function, and there's some metadata, and, and that's basically it. So all the, all the data that exists, that is found by the parser, is really put into there, and you can work with it, and do some, some funky stuff. So this, for example, is uh, right here, what we do is, Okay. We uh, write some spelling mistakes. So usually the compiler would catch that for you if you bother to compile. Um, we use this build, uh, this, this first statement up there, um, will actually invoke this macro on the class test. What we'll do is it will look at all fields that are there, iterate them. If they are a function, it will take that function's expression, which is the function body. 
and it will uh, change that. So it will make a new block, which is an array of statements, which is converted into a block. It will take the identifier trace, call it with a kind of like before name. So afterwards, if you instantiate a test and you call foo, it will trace before foo and then foo. So this is basically, this is a very simple example, but this is kind of the road you would be going down to if you want to implement things like uh, aspect-oriented programming, things like that, you just want to inject things. And you can use auto-build, so this was build, as you saw. You can, build, you can use auto-build uh, on a certain class, and every class of subclasses it or implements it. Will, uh, will also be built with the same macro. So that's a nice way to, for example, um, to make macro functionality available easily. You don't have to write some sort of cryptic uh, things people are afraid of. Um, you just ask your users to implement an interface and then they get a whole range of, of things for free. So I will just show you I will show you some of the documentation right now. Um, okay. So basically, this is this is something that works with uh, works with auto build. For so, you know, this this interface here. Um, uses this auto build magic to bring a bit of syntactic sugar to, to the hex language. And uh, people who are on the list might remember there was some uh, wars raging about how properties <laughs> look like in the coming hex version. Um, and uh, the wars are over. Uh, but for myself, I've created something that will make it that makes properties easier for me, which is kind of uh, very similar to, to uh, what Ruby sometimes does to, to generate properties. So this is, these are basically shortcuts that will take a variable and transform it into a full-blown pro property with a default getter and setter and things like that. So you see the code up here will generate the code down there with all the getters and setters and things like that. And it rather intelligently if you have just one thing that is used as a dot code, you have two it's a getter and a setter, and things like that. And so um, yeah, you can you can write things rather well, or rather concisely, and you don't start taking shortcuts because many people sometimes because they would actually have to implement a property and write an empty setter and an empty getter, uh, they choose to make the field public. And at some point, uh, you would like to change the behavior of the subclass, and you can't. So um, with this, it's um, you can always choose to use public fields, um, but you should do it for the right reason. And uh, if you have to do it, but you're too lazy to do this, this is a way to accomplish it. Um, although that's going to become better in next as we've seen yesterday. Um, you set some rules. This is something many people ask for. For example, if you declare a variable, you want to initialize it directly. Um, Nicolas is not fond of that. But if you want to do this, you can. Um, so it will do this basically. If you put an underscore, then it comes from the constructor. This is just a constant, and this is it comes from the constructor, but it's optional, that's a default value, and things like that. And this is something I like quite a lot. I call it syntactic delegation, I think it might make sense. What you basically do is, for example, if you look at this class, which is a stack, it, there's an underlying array, and what we do here is we say we want to push pop iterator length forward into it. So what happens at macro time is this generates a push, a pop iterator on length, uh, well, three methods, and one property with forwarding field, which basically make Make, uh, which basically just forward everything to the elements, to the underlying data structure. So you can, so you just expose parts of the array, and you get this quite free. So you don't have to do these things. For example, um, some of you have sometimes coded as three, I believe, and uh, um, 
One thing that I had to do often was implement event dispatcher, I event dispatcher, um, which basically looked like you create your, you use a friend vanilla event dispatcher, and then you forward all your calls to it. And uh, with this, you just re you just have your event dispatcher, and you forward, and you get that all for free. You don't have to do it by foot. Um, there's another example, and you can also use, for example, uh, there are some filters. You can also use regular expressions, so, so say all fields that start with test, or I don't know what, and then just those are going to get forward. And down here it becomes kind of crazy, but we won't cover that. Um, it's continuing. <coughs> Right here. Um, okay, then there's another project. Okay, I don't have it on, so let's not waste time. Um, there's another project called Hex Operator. Yeah, or Hex Op. Um, what it does is it brings operator overloading to Hex. Um, but because it's a macro, you just you really choose um, to have op operator overloading in the scope of a single class. So you don't have kind of uh, several libraries coming and having a battle within your code about who gets who gets control of what the plus does to arrays. <laughs> you just really say, okay, this class uses uh, quaternion mathematics, for example, and then you can add quaternions together. Or there is one that overloads uh, plus equals so that you can use it to add handlers to signals and things like that. You have to choose whether you want, but you can use it at a very, very granular level and it's also working through um, through this auto build magic that I've done because it basically you just implement an interface in your class and then the macro gets run and it transforms all your methods. If the operators <coughs> don't make sense to the type, it will pick that up and will replace that. Um, yeah. And oh yeah that's uh sync reactors. Um, this is basically uh, so the things I've shown you, that's uh, a bindable metadata, and if you use that on a class, okay, on a class that's going to be implemented on a property, then it becomes bindable. So uh, all the boilerplate that will notify people of the changes um, is generated for you, like MXML did it, uh, MXML C, and uh, so yeah, works the same way. So um, you can also uh, use context declare types to declare enums classes or types. I think that is there, um, and you can use this for a lot of things. Um, this is just a very crazy idea. What you can basically do is uh, there's somewhere in the hex uh, page there's an AS3 parser. What you can do at macro time you can uh, use that parser to pass some AS3 source code. And you can uh, use context declare type to declare hex classes out of that on the fly. So during compilation, you can include hex classes if you want to. I mean, it's a very crazy idea. But uh, having some XML-based uh, descriptive language, something like that, makes a lot of sense. Basically, you can you can take an XML, you load it, and you generate a, a class out of that because it's, it's faster than kind of looking into in the past XML at runtime. Um, but I will not. I'm not doing anything of this right now. <laughs> doing examples, but that's to uh, give you some crazy ideas. Um, in fact, this feature I used um, because of the slow speed of uh, anonymous functions on Flash and C++. Um, I used it in my tweeting engine to try to get more, more speed out of it. So instead of using anonymous functions. Um, I, generate, I had extra classes that kind of did the tweening functor objects, and uh, I was pooling them and things like that. And you can you can really just generate those on the fly, and it allows you a lot of cool things when you really need it. So, yes, and this is something. The last thing I was saying, um, you can post process all the information that you have. Um, there's a lot of text to take in, but you can generate a lot of things from that. So basically, at the end, before the compiler kind of flushes out all the results, um, you can really just uh, look at all the things that are there, and you can do some funny things. Uh, this is legacy since yesterday. Legacy code. 
Um, before there was no uh, cross-platform implementation for property reflection. Um, this is a macro that basically does what you need. It will, you see, um, this is a suitable parameter for context to generate. It will consume all the types. It will look into those types if they are a class. Then it will get that class. If it's not an interface, it will go through all the fields. And it will basically look at the read and write access, and it will store this into the metadata interface. That's what it does, and the metadata persists until runtime. In the runtime, if you need to do a property reflection, you can look into the metadata, you can look at an object, find its class, look at the metadata, and then you can call the, the actual access. So they work. And if you slap a cache onto it, it's actually very fast, but uh, generates a bit of code. Um, so a couple of projects I wanted to show that, that um, also use this, use, use macros in general. Um, okay, this one, the first one I've posted, I've written using macros a type set tween engine. So if you try to tween property that is not there, it'll throw an error. It also does some sort of optimizations with factor objects that you generate on the fly. Um, currently it's slower than using anonymous functions. Amazing, on Flash it's slower, I don't know why, I have to look into that. Um, and it has, oh, maybe I'll just show it. Um, sorry. Oh, that's because it's dead. So, this here. Okay, this takes a while. You can buy it? Ah, okay, it's here. Uh, okay, so, um, this is a normal tweeting engine, as you know, and then um, what is quite special about it is because it uses macros, you can you can rather easily um, add plug-ins, things like these, like the blur filters and stuff like that. Um, many tweeting engines do that, but they kind of have this rooted in their code base, and the way this works in this engine is because it's at macro time. Um, when, when you try to tween a property that it's not there, um, it will look into the into the plugins that are compiled by means of import or about any kind of dependency that you introduce, and it will try to resolve that problem with that plugin. So you don't. Uh, so basically, as soon as a plugin gets compiled because you import it, um, it gets picked up by the engine, and so. The, uh, the engine itself is kept really clean, and you can you can add new plugins without changing the uh, engine code at all. Um, sorry. Well, the engine, in principle, it also happens to work on PHP, <laughs> in the sense that you don't have time, but you can start tweens on objects, and then you can advance time manually. It will just uh, update the properties, and you can just look at them and see that. that uh, Oh, the values are correct, whether they make sense is up to you too. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's uh, select hx and select xml. I believe uh, James covered that a bit yesterday. Uh, you use that in some tools? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the is done as well, so it's really uh, the really to get important. Yeah, so just to give you back the gist of things. And this is uh, this is basically what select hacks looks like. You just have a, a CSS selector. You say you select it, and then based on a lot of information it has, it will really tell. Okay, this is not a bunch of uh, HTML nodes. It's really uh, these are <coughs> that in that case, I believe, and it will, it will really understand that. And you don't have to do any cast, and it's all very type safe. Basically, this is a nice way to um, to start out with to uh, build something like DOM tools. In fact, that's what we have with uh, merging projects. 
Yeah. I don't think you could use it as a way of automatically defining the right type force. Because we've got the type S. Yeah. There's a nice way to use Dom to automatically recognize the type S and then think they're all uh, done. Yeah. So, so, yeah, uh, it, it's a good basis to get uh, started on something like dumb tools or uh, a hex comp, uh, hex equivalent of jQuery that kind of doesn't do all this kind of overloaded jQuery stuff, which is nice, but it doesn't really work with our language. But to do something uh, clean and just as expressive and safe, and um, I think it's basically uh, doable. Um, there's the same thing for XMLs where you can do this with XMLs and you can add some additional type information. So you can say um, you have oh, that's an example here. So for example, you can define okay, this is this is my XML format, and it's also documented. Um, and then you can start uh, querying on those things, and it, it stays type shape basically. So um, Maybe there's ways to generate this from DTDs or something like that. And not that it has not been done yet, but it sure can be. And it's a nice way if you if you just want to interface with an XML API, or let's say if you have to interface with an XML API, um, you can just really uh, try to type that, and then you can go extract things, and you will get uh, you will get it in the right type. Um, Okay, what else? Uh, SCUTs? I guess some people know SCUTs. I hope. Yes? No? Okay, SCUTs is uh, a bit crazy. I can't claim that I fully understand it. Um, but it's a, a cool library uh, if you like um, Veritas syntax. Um, it has some sorts of Pythonic uh, comprehensions and things like that. So this. Uh, it looks a bit like Egyptian to me as well. <laughs> but uh, it's cool. <laughs> okay. And if you're, if you're used to this kind of language, um, you can use that in Hex. If you don't like it, um, if it's too complicated for you, um, don't. You don't have to. Um, but you, you can, without forcing Nicola to implement this. <laughs> And there's uh, monads as well, which basically uh, use uh, Haskell monads to uh, to hacks. Oh, let's say the general idea. Um, and these two are two things I'm currently working on. Um, I will maybe uh, show this. Okay. We're almost there. Um, so, yes. Okay, this is some more code. On page. Okay, so this is, uh, you all know SPOT, I suppose. Um, this is something a bit similar, but it's not object oriented at all. <coughs> what uh, this project attempts is to bring um, the relation model, database model di directly into X without passing by objects. Because sometimes that's a bit kind of a leaky abstraction because it's kind of, I mean, you have on the one side you have rigid tables and on the other side you have kind of like a full mushy face objects to what you would like to have and some polymorphism and things like that. It doesn't work so well together. Um, so much like you would do in s you can define your, your structure and then you can go start querying. So for example, you can say uh, users select this stuff not very much. Um, but it will basically generate the SQL query. And I've asked for the type here. Uh, and it will say, OK, this, the type of this is it has a status that is an int and a name that is a string, which by uh, what corresponds to what you find here. And so it's type safe. But what it really does is it just sends off the, the, those, the SQL query, it sends it to the server. And it gives you back the object almost untouched without build, uh, pushing it into a whole instance and things like that. And uh, if you think of it, SQL, oh, the model of SQL is actually nice. The language is a bit weird, and the error reporting is useless. <laughs> but it's actually a clever idea, and 
Um, I'm trying to bring that to, to heads a bit, which is what Link and C Sharp is also about. And I'm kind of working down that road. Um, so, yeah, <coughs> I will refer to the third distribution this time. And there's this bit in front, which is basically, I won't show it, but it's a uh, bit like Lambda. But it's macro based, so you can do, write these kinds of expressions on arrays and things like that um, without any runtime overhead. In some cases, it's even faster than with code, but I don't understand myself why that happened. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, to draw the conclusion, so what's important about macros is um, they allow us uh, type based meta programming. So we can write code that modifies our own code, but it all stays uh, in the safe harbor. The hex compiler. Uh, it will do us if we. It will tell us if we do something really strange, and it can bring typeset into our very small uh, dynamic uh, to our small <coughs> embedded domain specific languages that we that we use for all sorts of things. I mean, you might not always call it like that, but you often create models that are that um, bring a lot of semantics, and very little code. But sometimes we have the problem that it just at one time it crashes because we made a typo or something like that. And uh, you can totally avoid that with macros. Um, and so um, what I would uh, like you to do is uh, to try macros yourself. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's <coughs> totally worth it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, there's not many languages that have a list like macros with type safety. I think Numerly is currently the only other that has it. Scala is working on something. Um, there's not so many. This is a new area. Um, we like reinventing the wheel. Uh, this is uh, a place where you can actually invent the wheel for a change. Yeah. Um, it's fun. <laughs> if nothing else, it's a lot of fun. Um, if you don't have time for all that, then uh, still please uh, kind of contribute ideas because the thing about macros is if you can imagine it, uh, you can write a macro. <laughs> <laughs> you really can. I mean, it's, uh, with a few restrictions, it's really bad. Um, or, yeah, just please uh, use the macro based libraries I, I showed you because then they will come a lot better. Or reliable. Um, most of them are already, or well, parts of them are. Um, and just give uh, us feedback. There's a couple of people in the next community who are really into macros, and we're trying to uh, push this forward with some crazy things that are fast, safe, concise, and you really just do small things. And um, yeah, in the end, I think it's also time for us to, to think about. How we use hacks because it is really possible as of well as of quite some time ago, but we, it took us long to realize, I think, at least me. Um, we can really change a lot of lot of things and the way we make them because we can really create uh, small concise languages to do to do other things. So we don't necessarily need all those kind of enterprisey-ish, super professional. Uh, Code coverage, I don't know what tools. I mean, those are great tools. Um, but we might not need them as often as that if our code base is shrunk to a third, a tenth sometimes. And uh, we can do this. I believe we can. Yes, um, okay. That's really good. Um, if you have a teenager instead of defining the PhD, you want to extract information from the code. I'm thinking of producing kinds of uh, ideas where you might want to run a, a dummy compilation mm -hmm. to extract uh, type information. From yeah, for, for completion support. Yeah, like that. so. Um, instead, so instead of outputting the hexamals, you would, you would want to uh, output 
Um, well, you can do that. I mean, I try to. You can do a macro format. I try to kind of uh, get this idea across here. You can really, um, before the generation, um, you have all this information and you can write a macro that's, that does this for you. So it can really uh, take all the classes or just some classes from some packages and it will give you the information in any form you might want. It's up to you to, to write it that way that you get what you really need. And does that answer your question? Yeah. I think maybe, maybe you did something. I'll put some from, 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 from that uh, list of the types. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, you, you can, like, I mean, if you take this sample code, this just really expects all all fields that are that have accesses, but it's just as simple to yeah. expect all types that are yeah. classes and. But, but, but then you you're doing some context make expressions, and yeah. it's not really outputting something. You can write files. Yeah, you can write. Files. You, oh, yeah, yes, you, you can write, write files. Yeah, you can write two files. Yes, uh, I didn't mention that. Well, it's basically the, the macros uh, run on on something that is very similar to the Nico VM. You can almost always assume it is the Nico VM. And you have most of the APIs. Third generation. Yeah, and then compile. And then choose to compile. I don't know how to stop the generation, but you can always throw an error. Okay. <laughs> That makes for, can you target like a particular target? Because that's another major issue that I discovered from chatting to a few of the ID people. They want to do code completion, but for just like JS code. So if you're in the middle of JS and you want to target just JS, you've got the if K code, uh, these different types like JS. Like okay, code. good. Can you get the class information just for a particular target? You get the class information for the target that you are currently compiling for. Cool. So we have all of that. So, that's so whatever cool. compile time flex you set, whatever your platform is, it's just this branch that is going to be passed, and therefore it's just that information that you're going to have. Okay. Okay. Uh, just. A yeah, it's just a simple question, probably. When when you use the macros, mm -hmm. um, it goes through that intermediate stage. How do you get to that? Do you get to see the intermediate stage? Where, like, if you want to test whether it was doing what you thought it was doing, yeah. how do you see what it's doing before it goes to the decompiled? Um, testing macros. Testing macros is this a bit tricky, yes. Yeah. So, can you get a printout <laughs> yeah, of the um, I am. Well, you have to do this by hand, basically. You can just uh, use standard string to flush it out, but you, it's uh, like this. Uh, um, that there's a number of libraries that will basically just uh, take an expression and make readable hex code from it, uh, and you that's just look at it. Yeah. And so. Tinkerbell also has that. You just have expression to string, and macro tools also yeah. has it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's I think there's four implementations. Uh, yeah, it seems <laughs> like it's four implementations. It seems like it's one thing. So in the core, I can do I can do a pull man's debugger by just tracing the code after every line to see if I'm reaching it. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing, which is related to compilers and IDEs. Okay, if I've got my code and I've got all these lovely macros, I'm one of the new macros in my library. So my query is, uh, and we're not really into macros, I have a really not yet. Not yet. Um, is if you've got someone's got that file out, how can an ID when they don't they need to inject those macro calls to go through your code, find like the type of submission? How would you go about doing that? Because when you match you get those macro calls to your code and um, well there's a couple of ways to uh, to call macros. There's the natural one, they occur somehow in code that gets compiled. So they get executed. And the other one is you can add a macro call to the compiler as a parameter. You can say invoke this macro during the build process and then it will do whatever you want. Okay. Any more questions? Like, can anyone answer the difference between the, some of the expression types are basically the most confusing thing about macros? And all the different elongs for all the different expression types? Yeah. 
Can anyone explain the difference between the display and the display new? Because everything else. Oh, yes, I would like to know that. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> the display and display new. The two of the expressions. The display new. I don't know if it's in the contract. Yeah, yeah. display new. Uh, e display is a uh, yes. Uh, e display is about the function. Yes, and e display new gets new. Yes, yeah, e display new is basically way to uh, the completion for when you need a new constructor, constructor parameter. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I want. So to this, you can get completion in two macros. Yeah. So it's just also. No, but the distinction wasn't quite clear between e display and e display new. Yeah, yeah. I think in fact every single one of those types have an example of it. That's what I've that guy I've put in sort of set to the code and just tick them off because I went the kind of way that's an example of that. Yeah, you did not there's no way to get a completion for the time generation and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so I never got I just went like I'll handle it. I don't know. I can't say it about it. <laughs> So now we all know. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Could you use uh, a new hash target in my book? Um, you could. Um, <laughs> should you? Yeah, it's a, no, it's a, seriously, it's a great way to uh, prototype this. I mean, I don't know whether it's a great way to prototype it, but um, if you are not like into uh, starting a camo tomorrow, but uh, you feel that macros are easier, which is kind of the position I was in, um, then you could essentially now decide to, to build a target. You have information. You, you have all the information, and uh, recently there has been, in fact, a change. You can uh, use the type expression and then start traversing. Seven. Just Seven. until recently, they were fully opaque to you, basically. Seven. But now you can really look into it and you can go and generate it all. Actually, you can already customize the way JavaScript are output by the compiler by writing uh, a like kind of plugin for the compiler that is already passed. And it's uh, like an example JavaScript generator of what we pass. And you can change it any way you want. And this way, you can, for example, split uh, uh, your JavaScript into several files, package files, or one file, but one part of HTTP file, or one part of whatever you want. So it's like, it can also be used for compiler, uh, compiler customization. That's a question for you. Is there a speed difference? So you start yes. with another camera. It's huge. So it'd be interesting to know the speed difference. Ma 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 macro macros and themselves, uh, macro execution themselves are. Uh, it's an emulator. It's running inside the compiler. Right. So it's emulating the Lego VM. It's running quite surprisingly quite fast. But no. uh, but it's not native, and uh, so you have to be careful to do like a lot of calculus. But in general, it's quite fast enough. But uh, the thing is that uh, you need, to, before running the macro itself, uh, you need to kind of type all the macro class and initialize them. Before yeah. Compiler cache helps, kind of helps there yeah, because you can cache your yeah. typing macros class. Uh, in some cases, it's important to have. <laughs> And, is a, and we are planning at some point to also be able to have kind of persistent macro context across compilations uh, that we can kind of, well, some stuff. <laughs> so it's a discussion point, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, any more questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, is it possible to open socket, for example, do you have a total Nico capability of? Yeah. Yeah, um, okay. is it divided? Basically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, some things that don't, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, you can do HTTP in macro. I think uh, that's too light of what I've Would the would the overhead be massive compared to say writing a file? Oh, it, I mean, depends on the server. Depends on the server, server yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry, local. <coughs> yes, sure. local. Yeah, for us. The socket. Probably well, if it's badly implemented, writing a file is probably better. Yeah. 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 You think it'd be faster. <coughs> Anybody else? Can you get all the uh, imports from the file? And the macro get all the imports in the module, basically. Yeah, can you tell with uh, the file imports? So um, well, there's, uh, you can tell whether something is imported um, in a very uh, way by um, generating an expression that, that is that will evaluate to this class without the full path and you can ask the typer to type it 
<laughs> the details are so important. I've been thinking about uh, it would be cool if you had uh, sort of XLIP integrated uh, with import and uh, XLIP. So you could expand it and uh, it could pull from hidden or whatever. Yeah, currently imports and using are not uh, really exposed to, uh, to macros. It, it would be um, very nice also, um, this is <laughs> if we could uh, add a hook for when our pipe is not found before yes, it's happened. That would be really good. Yeah, that would be very nice. You, <laughs> can't, you can't see it that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Okay, then uh, thank you very much.